So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base? How do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number three. Well, hey, this is Ed Matthews, and we're really excited to have Stephanie Cabral with us, real estate entrepreneur extraordinaire, and uh, I'm obviously joined by my partner in crime, Rich Brown. So welcome, all of you. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for uh, making time out of your extremely busy schedule to meet with us today. So welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Ed. Thank you so much, Rich. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation and talk to you both. Excellent. Well, great. Can't wait to get started. Let's dive in. In terms of folks that may not follow you or may not have heard you speak on other podcasts, can you tell us a little bit about your business and how you got into this and you know what you're all about? Currently, I'm a buy and hold investor. I have 18 units, no partners. They're all sole members. So I'm the CEO and the janitor all at once for these properties. And I built them up over time. It's spread out over between single families, duplexes, and two triplexes. I got started in 2012, so I'm just under a decade in. And it's funny, I had had 13 units at the beginning of the year and then bought six in Q1. So it's really amazing how things kind of can snowball. But I got into real estate sure. by accident. I didn't know what I was doing was investing when I first started. So to give you some context, I'm a lawyer by trade. I call myself a recovering lawyer, and that is going to take a long time. I knew pretty quickly in my career, probably actually before I started my career, but in the transition from law school into the practice of law that I actually didn't want to sit at a desk. And so this was a huge conflict because I had taken on student loans. I had taken on the identity of being a lawyer and really had to transition mm. into figuring out, well, okay, what am I going to do next? And I didn't have the answers, but I knew that I wanted the flexibility to pursue whatever that answer may be. So I took a position at a family owned firm that gave me tremendous flexibility and also part-time hours, but in exchange, I sacrificed and took a part-time salary. So when I went to purchase a house that I wanted to live in, I didn't qualify for anything that I was happy to buy. So I had mm -hmm. to kind of change strategies a little bit. I didn't want to buy a single family house that I was going to be embarrassed about. So I started talking to different agents to, and also to my parents. And it was my mom who was like, why don't you buy a duplex in passing? She just kind of threw it out there. And I talked to my mortgage broker and he's like, oh yeah, you can qualify for a lot more if you have a duplex. Cause you can use the rental income from the tenants towards your DTI. And I was like, whoa, game changer. So all of a sudden I go head first into finding a duplex and they're still outside of what I could buy. So I ended up finding this condemned, <laughs> this condemned wretched duplex in the best part of town, in a town that I grew up in. And my agent had mentioned the renovation loan. He's like, oh yeah, you can do a 203k with that. I walked in, I looked around, I was like, this is it. He's like, you're crazy, but I will take you through this process. So that was it. I did a renovation loan on it. I got the property uncondemned. And to this day, it's actually one of my best performing assets. So I lived on one side for about seven years. My PITI on the property was is about 1300. The rent from my tenant is about 1375. So I Perfect. lived completely for free for a while. And also in the renovation loan, it's super cool because you get to design your own house. Like how many people get to play Joanna Gaines on your first property? So there wasn't a single day that I didn't love it. It was just a great, great asset. I've since moved on from that property, but I have taken out a HELOC because I have a ton of equity in it. I refinanced mm -hmm. it. I have plans to build a third unit on it. The unit that I moved out of now serves as a short-term furnished rental that gets nineteen fifty a month. So the cash flow on that property is just tremendous. And that was my first deal. Yeah. It took me a ton of time. And you know, it took me probably over a year to find it, but it has paid dividends. And also I got into real estate investing. All of a sudden right. I learned, right. oh my, I think there was one month. This was what did it. There was one month where the tenant had moved out and I had to pay my own mortgage. And I was like, this is 
terrible. Why do people do this? So that <laughs> right. was really when I was like, okay, it's much better to have other people pay my mortgage than to have me pay it. So all of a sudden, then it just kind of took off from there. But it took me, I think, four years to buy the next property. Like it really took me a while to figure that out. But I had had then the foundation yep. of going through a renovation program, being a landlord for a few years, really just set the foundation for me to go into more properties. So it was great. With that first property and that whole experience, what was the hardest part for you when you dove in? Getting the mortgage was pretty terrible. Being financed through conventional financing is worth it because you get great terms, but there's only so many you can do before you pull your hair out. So you really have to have a lot of administrative stamina to outlast that loan program. So that was really tough, but I will say I got very lucky in that. So it was a $50,000 renovation and then a refinance afterwards. It was a process like that birth strategy, the equity recapture through refinancing, all of that. I didn't know any of that, but I got really lucky because I had an agent who was experienced and helped me learn what loan programs to use, right? I wouldn't have known about the 203k without him. I wouldn't have known that I could refinance it afterwards. And then I had a really great contractor who gave me a number when he estimated the project and then he stuck with it. All of those things could have gone terribly wrong if I didn't have a good team around me, but I got really lucky with people that were far more experienced than I was and took care of me. And I've done multiple projects and purchases with both of them afterwards. So yeah, I think that was kind of what made the transaction actually not that hard. And you were hooked. And what? And I was hooked. Yeah. Oh yeah. Give me more. I'll take four of those. (laughs) Right. So that's where you started. Now, where are you today? Tell us about what you're focused on today. So I have two more units that are short-term rentals. I think that's a really great strategy. Not short-term, I'm not doing Airbnb. I'm doing furnished rentals. So mid-length, three-month contracts to travel nurses. That's been great. So I've been slowly accumulating these singles and duplexes, but then basically matched almost 50% of my portfolio in the first quarter of this year. So my intention is to buy more multifamily at this point. It can be small multifamily. It can be mid-sized multifamily. I think that is where you benefit from the economies of scale. That's where ultimately I'm going. That's my next step. I'm in this interesting place of transition. It's kind of a cool time to be having this conversation because I had spent so much time building automation into my property management and we were a really well-oiled machine, but I've been trying to do a lot less in my business and start to focus on the more higher level things. And so even though we were a really well-oiled machine and my tenants were getting auto emails and just regular contact that they thought was me, like all the process building, I had spent tons of time doing it. It was great, but it still requires a lot of energy to manage a property, right? So you've got maintenance requests, which are completely reactive. It's probably the only thing that's completely reactive. Turnover, And so I was starting to become the point of contact for a lot of subs and managing more projects that I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I found myself kind of hiding behind the tasks of management, of responding to emails. And I'm a really good manager, but that's not what I'm in real estate for. I'm not in real estate to manage my own properties. So I just recently hired a property manager And I will tell you, it has been very difficult for me to let that baby go, but it has also completely freed up my time in a way that has been so, so glorious for me. One, I mean, my emphasis now is on marketing. No multifamily property owners have called me and asked me if they can sell me their properties. So I need to call them. So my emphasis now is on how do I implement that outbound marketing in a way that's repeatable and predictable and consistent without me making the calls. And I've spent so much time doing that automation in my property management that I'm now utilizing that into the outbound marketing. So I'm really just at the cusp of that, but very excited about what those next steps will be. Fantastic. So tell us more about that. What types of systems, obviously marketing, the key marketing is consistency, as you just said. So what is your MO? I mean, how do you automate that? How do you systematize it so that it is consistent and you can respond? 
again, I'm still in implementation mode. So we're That's not okay. a well-oiled we'll machine at you. this point. Yeah, <laughs> man, Ed, I feel like you could be the one giving this part of the speech, but the, what <laughs> I'm working on is ringless voicemail campaigns, actually. So I'm in a mastermind group. They specialize in wholesaling, which isn't okay. my it's not my priority at all, but they do volume. The guys in this group and girls right. are doing incredible amounts of volume. And so I'm kind of trying to pick and choose the strategies that I'm hearing float around there. So it's a lot of cold calling, direct mail, SMS campaigns. But what I'm finding, I think that would make a lot of those other strategies, all outbound marketing strategies would make a lot of sense if I was targeting single family property owners with pain points, but I'm not. I'm focusing on multifamily owners who are really colleagues of mine. They're people that right. have owned for a long time and them getting a cold call from a Filipino assistant who I have a Filipino assistant. I adore her. I'm not going to have her call Ed Matthews to find out if he wants to sell his property to Stephanie Cabral. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think it's a matter of know your audience. So the ringless right. voicemail campaign, I'm really excited about because I think that it offers the genuineness that I would want to have if I were to call someone directly. You're still gonna get my voicemail, right. you're gonna get my name, you're gonna hear me give a message. And I am calling them, I'm just calling lots of people but I don't right. have to be the one doing it. Exactly. Right. So I can have a pre-recorded message, a list of people that I want to send this out to, and my VA drops that voicemail to all of those people. And then what I also really like is that on the phone call recapture, they're all being captured into a phone system that has the transcription of the voicemail because some people are going to be angry yeah. right like whenever I send right. out marketing pieces there's always the like we hope you die message that comes yeah. back just occasionally <laughs> yeah. and yeah. that's okay but I don't want to yep. hear it and I also and I certainly don't want to be on the phone for them to tell me so I really like right. the idea of just being able to read it and be like hey assistant can you just take this number off the right. list so that is going to be we just finished it today and she'll be my assistant's going to be doing her campaign like a test campaign today so I'm hoping oh, wow. maybe sometime in the middle of our call I'll get a voicemail drop here so we'll see yeah awesome. fingers crossed awesome. well, yeah that's fantastic yeah. So uh, I'm just curious, what technology are you using to do your drops? Slide broadcast is okay. the one that I'm using for my ringless voicemail. So I'll kind of give you the whole tech stack. Uh, I'm sure. using batch leads to track my data. I'm going to be using batch leads to pull lists. Slide broadcast is the ringless voicemail. And then yeah. cloud phone is the phone number that will be receiving the calls and doing the transcript and sending me the email. And I think a lot of people use Google Voice, but right. the problem is, is that if you have a number that gets flagged or if you need to have multiple numbers, you can't have it all go, like you can't really change your Google Voice number that easily. And I already use right. my Google Voice number for business anyways. So I want right. to have numbers that I can easily just toggle out, have multiple extensions, different voicemails. Right. So I needed a more robust solution than Google Voice. So right. cloud phone. So Steph, Excellent. when you think about success with this campaign you're going to run, like what would be success for you? How will you measure that? So it's all about tracking the funnel. So the success would be, and I actually don't really know at this point, but I'm assuming that you've got a certain number of outbound calls, and then I'm hoping for 5% return my call and then maybe 5%, I don't know. I do think that ringless voicemails get more of a response than a text message or a cold call or something like that because people check their voicemail. So yeah, I think normally it's like a 2% response. So I'm hoping for, I don't know, four to five. Okay. And then just as the funnel goes smaller, just keeping that percentage up. But yeah, Rich, you'll have to, we'll have to do a part two, even offline just to see what the numbers look like. Exactly. Absolutely, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> Tell us all about all your successes and the and the properties you're buying. And Rich and I can sit here in complete jealousy watching you grow your portfolio. Ah, great. Good for you. That's great. Thank you. So it's, it's an exciting time for sure. Yeah. So you got bit by the bug going on about 10 years ago and you're unique, right? I mean, I, I meet a ton through CT Rio, Rich and I meet a ton of prospective entrepreneurs, right? And mm -hmm. they all want to get into this business 
And it, it usually falls into, you know, a handful of buckets of whether or not they act. And with regard to the ones that have a little struggle in reacting, it, it's, uh, I don't have money, I don't have time, I don't know where the deals are, or some version of, I'm just flat out afraid, afraid of succeeding, afraid of failing, whatever, right? Yeah. And it's perfectly valid stuff. So how did you break through? You're a professional, you had a successful law practice, you were doing quite well, and you got mm -hmm. bit by the bug. And if I heard you right, I don't think you practice law anymore other than probably for no. yourself. Yeah, no, I'm full time in real estate, man. I think it's a complete commitment to the end result. If you know what the end result is, for me, I'm a planner. And so I right. could envision the steps. I knew what steps I needed to take. And I also knew which huge gaps I needed to overcome. So yep. one of my huge gaps was, well, I've never saved for a down payment before. So what do you do? So all of a sudden I started just the pay yourself first method, right? So I just, anytime mm -hmm. I got a paycheck or received income from another stream, I just took 10% of that and I set it aside in my bucket. And yep. pretty quickly, I all of a sudden had enough money for my down payment, my reserves and that kind of built up. So I just envisioned it one step at a time and then definitely surrounding yourself with people that can help you overcome those questions. Like I wouldn't have been able to do the loan, the 203k loan without having sure. knowledge of it. Right. So that was really helpful. And then, I mean, in my situation, again, I wasn't looking for an investment. I was looking for a place to live. So I really wanted to find it and I obsessed about it was the best decision I ever made or the best obsession I've ever had because I was able to get to the end result. But also like, I'm okay with risk. I'm a risk taker just as long as it's calculated and measurable. And I think that that's another piece. Like if you're not a risk taker, then you either need to work on your mindset or you need to partner with somebody who is, because if you can't get past that, then you can do all the research in the world, but you're going to talk yourself out of every deal. There's always an unknown that could give you an out, right? So you're going to have to work through that. So I think it's a complete yeah. commitment to the end product and being willing to work through some of the unknowns and have a leap of faith that they will get worked out. At least you've got a plan for how they're going to get worked out. Absolutely. I was just talking about this with somebody else that in my company, what we do is we plan for mushroom clouds on the horizon. And then when they don't occur, we're pleasantly surprised and we're a little yeah. more profitable than expected. And so, but yeah, it would be impossible uh, on that. to underwrite for every possible scenario. Did I underwrite sure. for a year of an eviction moratorium? No, I didn't. I had a flip that really kind of imploded because the guy yeah. stayed there for a year rather than leaving. And that, that flip is how we met, right? In the basement. Yep. That's right. In six <laughs> inches of water. Yeah. By the time he <laughs> finally moved out, it was like closer to 12. Oh, I did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. But that's right. Yeah, and that's I follow you on social media. <laughs> yeah. So funny. And I follow you on social media as well. And I've seen you. That was a gut rehab, if memory serves, right? It wasn't planning to be, but right. yeah, it became a gut rehab. It just, it was unhygienic. It wouldn't have, I don't know. I don't want to go into it. I don't want to relive yeah. that, but let's just say <laughs> so I've dramatic. seen plenty of really bad houses, but this one, yeah. I had to run out of the house multiple times gagging over the side rail. I couldn't handle yeah. being in that house. It was that bad. He yeah. had horrible mental health issues. He wasn't yeah. a bad guy at all. He just had mental health issues. But yeah, it ended up yeah. being a full gut. And since it's a full gut, we might as well move some walls around. And now it sure. is sure. the best floor plan. I'm actually like, I get really excited going through it. I think it's going to fly off the market. And, and I got, I'm also pretty lucky that it's a great time to sell. So we're about 30 days from bringing that to market, I think I'll actually wow. do fine on it despite all the problems, but I didn't underwrite for it. And right. I also didn't underwrite for a huge market uptick too. So I kind of right. balanced out. Yeah. The fact is, is that you've owned that because you and I have known each other for almost a couple of years now, right? So time heals a lot of ills in real estate yeah. world, right? Well, more so in rentals than in flips. In flips, you've got a very mm -hmm. short period of time to make your money and then you're out, right? Typically your loan right. term has a very short payoff period. 
am very lucky. I happen to be in private money for this and offered to mm -hmm. pay him off when I knew that the guy wasn't going to leave. And he's like, nope, let's just stick it out. So he's been with me through a year and a half now. He's doing great. Let's just yeah. put it out there. He's been paid on time in full every month. Right, I think it actually right, worked out right. way better for him. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's end up being a really good, good deal. Buying investment real estate is both thrilling and sometimes stressful. Without a lending expert by your side, most investors don't stand a chance. That's where CT Rea Funding comes in. CT Rea Funding was founded by investors to help investors just like you fund their deals. Whether you're buying a single family rehab, an apartment building, or really any investment property, our team will understand your deal and help you close quickly. Go to ctreiafunding.com or call us at 860-876-0572. You just mentioned something really interesting. You talked about private money. Is that a big part of what you do? How do you pay for your deals? Yeah, so everything that I've done so far has been a distressed property where I'll do the Burr strategy and I, I do the equity recapture when I refinance. To do that, you need to have hard money or some form of short-term, more risky financing at the beginning because you're doing a rehab. So to do that at the beginning, I'll typically use either hard money or private money. Uh, I'll use lines of credit that I have, private lenders, things like that. So yeah, some combination of all of those too. Thank you for that. Because we deal with a lot of people who are beginning investors and they always yeah. say things like, I don't know where to get the money. I don't know yep. how I'm going to finance this. So I have a great deal, but I don't know what the next step is. So I'm glad that you shared that. Yeah. So even for me, as I look to take the next step in my business, I'm looking for larger multifamily. I don't have the cash sitting around for buying a 10 unit or a 20 unit, but I know lots of people that do and lots of people that have expressed an interest in investing with me. So I know that when I find it, I can reach out to my network and do some sort of equity partnership. So yep. it yep. doesn't have to be your money that gets the deal closed. It just has to be money. Great point. All cash spends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You've had a, a really interesting real estate career and you've done a lot of different things. I'm just curious. I know that you are big on finding mentors and also mentoring other folks that are trying to get into this. So let me ask you, what's the best advice you ever gotten? Who gave it to you? Okay. So this, I think, is my favorite one. It's your okay. network is your net worth. And I don't know, I mean, it's said so often, it's almost not taken seriously, right? Because everybody yeah. knows it. But I think that my network, and I don't want to use the word network. I really don't like it because that implies that it's kind of like heavy lifting. Networking is the best part of my week. It's going to like your meetings and having so much fun, seeing yeah. all the people that have become friends. Every time I yeah. have a conversation with somebody, whether it's somebody far more experienced or somebody brand new, I get something out of it. And so Absolutely. by continuing, I mean, we, there's no real education. There's no real like formal community that you would participate in except for the one that you build. And by expanding your network, you expand your resources, you expand the information that you have, the people you call. I cannot tell you how many times I've had questions on contractors or needed referrals or, yep. hey, I'm going through this, what do I do? And people call me the same time and sometimes I'm like, hey, I have no idea. Please tell me when you find the answer. I didn't even know I didn't right. know that, right? So right. I think having an intention to network and build your network is the best thing that you can do when you're not just starting off, but I took over a networking group and it has paid me in dividends. It's been amazing. Just the people that I've met, I've actually made money from it as well, but just the information that I get, you get inspiration too. So I mean, Absolutely. I can go on and on, but your network is your net worth and it doesn't need to be formal. It can be people that you meet up with for drinks or people that you go for walk with or accountability partners, or I mentioned right. I'm in a mastermind group. So I find all of these are different ways that I learn and grow, but they're, awesome. all, they're all my network. So obviously you get a, a lot of traction with the people that come into contact with you. And I'm looking forward to your next meeting, by the way, because I'm going to be there. Oh, good. But yeah, I can't wait. I mean, well, with COVID, it was so difficult as CT Rhea and with your group, we're in the meeting business and we can't meet. So it's, uh, it was a big challenge. 
but uh, yeah, we all muscled and I was, through. I was so good about social distancing. And now that I've got my vaccination, Absolutely. like let me out of the cage. I am ready <laughs> to Absolutely. Like, go talk to people. You know, having your first meeting back, you had great attendance and it was, yeah, it was great a lot to of fun. see everybody. Just like, hey, really what are you up to? Wow, that's amazing. You really grow in those meetings. Yeah, it was like a reunion almost. <laughs> that's a, right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah. So my, you know, wait, you, one, you one come from a thing. Yeah, just sure, one funny thing. So yeah. my networking, my meeting, I guess, our slogan is mingle, don't co-mingle. So I want to share that with ah. you guys. I think that's <laughs> yeah. good, inv- well, good advice for clever. real estate investing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, what were you saying, Ed? So I was just remarking how excited I am to go see that or to meet with that networking group that you've formed. I always find that I get smarter when I meet people that are in this business. And I typically, you can find that one nugget, that one person who's going to be able to tell you what they're doing and what's working. And and worst case, it inspires you to go come up with your own plan. And at best case, you go and you model exactly what the person you just talked to is doing. And we all make each other smarter, which is wonderful. I remember distinctly one time I was talking to somebody who was brand new and Mm -hmm. they asked me like, it was a simple question like, well, how did you find your first deal? And I was like, oh gosh, I just ignored the asking price and I offered what made sense. And then I stopped and I was like, man, I haven't done that in a while. Thank you for asking me, right? So this was a person that wasn't, she's not a mentor to me. She wasn't somebody that I would consider like, oh, I really want to get to her level. But her prompting me to think about what worked for me was actually the best thing that happened to me that night. So I mean, yeah, it doesn't you matter basics, who you're right? networking with, as long as they're Absolutely. willing to ask questions or you're willing to ask questions and that dialogue opens up. A lot of times we can answer our own questions sometimes. Without a doubt, yeah. without a doubt. So I've got to ask the hard question. This is a hard hitting like a 2020 question. You ready for this one? I don't Brace know. Brace yourself. <laughs> so have you implemented it since you've worked with that woman who inspired you by asking that question have you implemented it since have you just offered what you wanted to offer instead of looking at the asking price yes i have and so i actually have an offer going out today that i don't expect to get and i found that sometimes just my reputation or sometimes the lender that i'm using those things will help me win the bid even if i'm not the highest bidder so yes i'm not consistent in my offering that's you know something that i'm hoping this ringless voicemail campaign and having more consistent leads will happen but yes i have done that but thank you rich for <laughs> holding me accountable i'm really glad i'm sending out this offer today <laughs> here's another question for you because i think another important thing that you just brought up is you have to make offers in order to get deals yeah right do, do you get turned down and how do you handle that yeah so i think you handle it just by saying okay fine one closer to a yes then. But also you can change the way that you phrase that offer to make the offer more palatable to the seller, even if they're not going to accept it. Let's say you offer them something they're never going to accept. I like to soften my offer by saying, hey, like I'm not really close to your asking price. If you get your asking price, great. I hope you do. I wanted you to have another number to work with just in case. And so you're really saying that works for me. And I think people recognize, like, I'm saying, I'm not expecting you to take this, but it's here and I can close and I'm really easy to work with. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, and I think I got this from you a while back. They're not saying no to you. They're saying no to your offer. Yeah. So there's no reason. It's never personal. Although selling a house can be emotional. It's never personal. Exactly. Exactly. And so by really taking that and making it softer for them, I think that they have a softer response in return, but yeah, it's, it's not personal. So make the offers and just again, one closer to yes. Yeah. One thing we do in our business is we try real hard and I would, I'm going to hold myself accountable here. I would love to say that we make an offer on every single property. We should, but we may not, we do not. And uh, you mean lead every single lead? Every in? single lead that if, if we walk a property and, and we get a good understanding, the hope is that we will offer on every property. There is a number, right, yeah. uh, that we'll buy it at. And we've gotten much better at that in the last six months. But what we do basically is it's a standing offer. So we'll write them an offer and we'll walk them through. We're pretty transparent, right? We'll, what we'll do is we'll walk them through exactly what their property is worth today, what it'll be worth if we flip it or if we acquire it and do what we're going to do. 
and the construction that rehab plan that comes along with that. And it's a standing offer, right? So our idea is we're going to honor that, whether it's today, tomorrow, two weeks from now, six months from now, two years from now. And it takes that edge off of the process, especially because in our business, and I think it's true in your business as well, that a lot of these are off mm -hmm. now that you're marketing as heavily as you are. I'm still in implementation right. mode, Ed. Still in implementation that's all right. mode. <laughs> all right. Well, but yeah, then tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I mean, I've been buying from wholesalers. I started with MLS deals and then auction deals. And yeah. I've been doing basically wholesaling from now. But what I'm finding is wholesalers are blasting to all of the internet communities. And so there's just a feeding right. frenzy. So yeah. while so I might've been a preferred buyer for some of the wholesalers, they no longer need to have one buyer. Right. They're going to farm it out. Uh, so yeah, you've got to kind of bypass the wholesaler unless you've got that relationship, that exclusive relationship, which I don't have. And you got to go direct to the source. So yeah, if you go walk a property, you should make an offer. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe and that's that, a metric you have to track, Ed, is how many offers do you not make? And this is the gold nugget I'm taking from this conversation. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Uh, <laughs> that's welcome. exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you should have a celebration every time that number is zero. Absolutely. Rich, networking, that's your wheelhouse as well, right? You've got a handful of wholesalers who pick up the phone and call you first, right? I do. I wouldn't say a cadre, a, a small group, but yeah, but I, I love what Stephanie is doing in, in terms of the ringless voicemail. When I look at my business and what we do, that is something I think we'd have to implement. But traditionally, I just, I like to press the flesh, shake hands and just grab a beer or an adult beverage someplace and just talk about how we can do deals. So kick myself for jumping in here, but Rich, I'll tell you, I like that too. And I think that's a really great way to start the conversation. And it's a great way to like do upkeep occasionally. But in between then, you can drop voicemails. Hey, it's Rich. I was thinking about you. Just wanted to see if you got anything in the pipeline. And I got to tell you guys, see, this is why Stephanie is on this podcast. Okay. Absolutely. This, this is how dollars get made. Thank you. I will implement that. Your wholesalers and my wholesalers are going to get the same voicemails. <laughs> I have a feeling that's what's going to happen. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, yeah. yeah that works. Know. They work. So Stephanie, what's your why? Fun, actually. I think that I want to live a life that's like really colorful, adventurous, well-balanced and fun. And I can't do that sitting behind a desk as a lawyer, having adversarial conversations with people. I really just want to have as much fun as possible during this time. And real estate has been a way to do that. Like I love the before and afters. I love my contractors. Actually, we've got great relationships. I love the agents that I work with. I love the networking. Like it satisfies that need to have a lot of fun. And it has also allowed me a really well-balanced life right now. So like I said, I've got a lot of time to now spend on this marketing. And I also, I've spent a lot of time this summer playing hooky and taking boating lessons with my dad, right? This is great. Oh, wow. So things that I wouldn't have been able to do spontaneously go out on the lake for a day if I was working a job. Mm. That's wonderful. One of the things that I know you have cooking is a very interesting 1031 deal that yes. I am dying to hear about. So oh, I'm going to put you on the spot and make you tell us all about this 1031 exchange deal that you're working on. Okay, let me see if I can do it justice. So right, cool. um, I bought a three family, I bought a three family earlier this year, as I mentioned, and uh, this three family needed a lot of work. So I planned on buying it with hard money and then mm -hmm. refinancing it. I haven't refinanced it yet. So I'm in the middle of that. So I'm going to end up leaving about 40,000 in the deal once all is said and done. Okay. I wasn't really sure where that 40,000 was coming from yet. So I have a bunch of single families that have a ton of equity. So I was thinking I was going to sell one of them, but I was already under contract for this three family. So I couldn't do the traditional 1031 where you sell a property, get the liquidity and use that liquidity to buy another property. I couldn't do that because I had to buy first. And in a random passing conversation with my accountant, I told him I was going to eventually do a 1031. And he's like, well, why don't you do it with this property? Well, because the timing doesn't work out. It's like, do a reverse 1031. Is that a thing? 
That sounds like a thing you just made up. No, this is a thing. And so basically you can do 1031 and defer your capital gains, but you buy your replacement property before you sell your relinquished property. So the catch to this is that you have to be able to buy a property without having the liquidity from your sale, right? So it's a really great transaction for if you're gonna do a burr. You've already got the means to buy that short term and you're gonna refinance out later so you can pull some cash out. So I right. had a single family that I bought a few years ago that I had refinanced it. I had pulled out like all my money plus 20,000. It was a, just a great burr but it wasn't like a strong cash flowing property. So when I buy properties, I use the cash on cash metric, but then mm -hmm. when I switch over to asset management, I look at my return on actual equity. I don't really know how to describe it, but basically the equity that I would take after fees and rehab right. expenses. And I see like, what am I making on that? If I were to sell and deploy that elsewhere, I think this was at like 1%. So I was like, time to sell. I think it was making like, after escrows and everything like that, it was making just under $100 a month. Not a great cash flowing property, but it had served its purpose. So I bought the three family using hard money and a line of credit, and then sold the single family. And I had about 100,000 net profit from the single family that is going towards buying the three family. But remember, I'm only gonna keep 40,000 into the three family. So when I refinance it, I'm pulling out 60, cause I had a hundred and then I'm putting right, the hundred right. towards, yeah. So hundred minus 40, 60. And then just to make this even better, someone saw that I had just bought a three family and they had another three family that they wanted to sell. And it was gonna take about 50,000 after all was said and done to hold into that. So I bought that one too. So uh, this property that the single family that was cash flowing just about 100,000 is projected to turn into 2,200 a month. So wow, I basically wow. used that one single family to buy two threes. And they're good performing assets. I mean, both of the triplexes are 35 to 45% cash on cash return. So really great returns, but I'm so thrilled with that transaction. That's a home run. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. You go. Wow. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Wow. That's outstanding. Yeah. So glad you brought that up, Ed, because I really wanted to make sure that yeah. was something that was shared because I had no idea that was the strategy. And in this market, especially when people are already burring, this market is prime for the reverse 1031 because the danger is you still have the timing requirements that a traditional 1031 would have, but right. your timing is triggered on the purchase of the property. And so then you just have to make sure you sell in time, but you already own the property and in this market, it's going to sell. So right. it's really, it's a very comfortable transaction. Yeah, so, I mean, I uh, think I had completed the whole thing in three months. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. phenomenal. Two months? Yeah. Ago? Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was a really great deal. And I hope other people are able to put that to use like I did. Yeah. Now I'm going to go back to my office and start looking at our portfolio and go, okay, where can I do this? Right. Yeah. I mean, I am going to liquidate at least three more single families and hopefully I can pull this why off not? again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not? Why yeah. not? Um, that you're clearly highly educated. And I'm just curious in terms of learning, one of the things I've learned about entrepreneurs like you and Rich and self and, and other people is that we're lifelong learners. Yeah. So uh, what is the most impactful business book? Let's start there that you've read. And when you read it, when you got into it, you thought, aha, this is it. I've got the ultimate yeah. golden nugget. Hands down. It's the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Love that book. Yeah. It's all about processes, systemizing. And that is what started me down this journey of creating predictable, repeatable results. So, Absolutely. and tracking those, seeing that you're not supposed to fly by the seat of your pants in business. And at that point, yes. like it's, yes. it basically could be named how to turn your hobby into a business. Yep. I love that book. I originally read the E-Myth, the original E-Myth book that he wrote back, gosh, that'd be in the 90s, right? He also updated a newer book for real estate entrepreneurs as well. It's outstanding. I'm more of an audio book guy because I spend my days driving around looking at deals or, or tracking projects. But yeah, it's an outstanding update and I highly recommend it. 
So how about real estate books? Speaking of real estate, <laughs> what have you read lately that has really hit the mark for you? Oh, lately? I haven't read any real estate books lately, actually. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think, is just such a game changer. It's something that if you haven't read it, you have to. Yep. Standard operating procedure. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah. Yeah, Without exactly. A doubt. Real Estate Investing 101. That, absolutely. I know you chase deals like the rest of us, but I also track you on or follow you on social media. You have created an amazing balance in your life, obviously. When you're not running around hair on fire trying to get deals done, you know, what do you like to do? How do you spend your time? Yeah. So I mentioned boating. The summer has yep. been a really cool time with my dad and out on the water learning to drive a boat, which... I've been fortunate enough to be driven on a boat a lot of times by my dad, but he always kind of let me get away with not doing anything. So now it's my time to figure it out. So I've, I've been loving it. I got to slip at a lake and I'm down there learning. And yeah, that's awesome. super fun. I play volleyball. I love to camp, hike, play with my dogs a lot. I'm really active. I like to be outside and play. I'm signing up for a cooking class the opposite of active, but, <laughs> 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 but I think it'll be also just a good thing to have in my repertoire too. So wonderful. Yeah. So if people want to reach out to you or follow you on social media, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, you can reach me by email. My company email is stephanie at sunrisebuyshouses.com. You can find me on bigger pockets. My username is SJ Cabral and then hashtag zero. On my profile in Bigger Pockets is the sign up form if you want to be added to the distribution list to the meetups. So that way you can find out when they're happening and keep them on your calendar. And then you can find me on Instagram. My company name is Sunrise Buys Houses. Sunrise Buys Houses is actually at Sunrise Real Estate on Facebook. I would say it probably doesn't make sense to friend me on Facebook. I have like over 700 requests that I haven't answered. So it's not personal. <laughs> I just stopped looking. Yeah, so don't yeah. friend me on Facebook. Friend me in real life. Come to my meetings. All right. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Stephanie Cabral, thank you so much for your time today. As always, I learn something new every time I talk to you. And you're absolutely brilliant. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Ah, thank you. This was super fun. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Rich. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a CT RIA presentation. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. If there's a specific topic you want us to cover, post it in the comments. For more information on the Real Estate Underground Podcast or CT RIA, go to realestateundergroundpodcast.com or ctria.com. Until next time, happy investing. This has been the Real Estate Underground. Don't forget to subscribe. It helps us grow. Until next time, undergrounders, remember your real estate journey begins with a simple step forward. Now get to it. Bye for now.